Afternoon, everybody. This isn't really going to be that exciting a stream. This is just a case of I have to get these done, and I figured I would sit here and annoy you all, or rather, you could entertain me while I got them done. Ah. Uh, <coughs> broken from factory is subjective, I suppose. I finally got a response back from Final 1114, take your pick on the name. And they said the factory cannot find any problem with the units. Um, they don't believe it's a batch fault, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, whatever. I said, I'm just fixing them myself anyway, because quite frankly, I don't have any more time for this. Um, you try to do nice things, like you try to let them know that there might be an issue. And, oh, that's right. They said, we've had no other people return the units or complain about it. And I explained to them that's probably for two factors. And one is that under Windows, it's an intermittent issue. The second is that most of the people who are buying these meters probably are not actually um, connecting them up to PCs in the first place. So, yes, uh, the device itself, the meter part of it works fine. It's only when you try to do communications and then under Windows you will get a intermittent, like every now and then it will probably stop transmitting a value or something like that for a second or two and then carry on. So it's not something that people are going to actually notice. Unless, of course, you happen to be doing what I was trying to do and you go, hey, my data keeps disappearing and the connection keeps failing. What's going on? So, anyway, corner case fault I guess for me and the factory's like meh not our problem hey Lexi and I can kind of half respect that that they don't care <laughs> as it is I got the peak meter brand from AliExpress and they're fine so it is only this batch of uh, digital ones that are faulty I can't even, you know, the CH340 chip is fine normally, so I don't know what happened to these ones. Hey, any triple five? Yeah, I've got to get them replaced because I can't send these out like they are because they will fail for people when they're using them for open board data. I probably shouldn't be using 460 on this, but whatever. Kind of makes things a bit smoky. And yeah, the user base is just incredibly small. Uh, it's not going to come up. I was, and I was just like, that's it. I'm not going to bother wasting my time anymore. I tried to help anyone who does have an issue with the meter and they happen to buy it from Farnell. Well, they can get a refund. But like I said, if you, it might just be this one particular batch and nothing else. But certainly the ones I got from AliExpress are fine. I mean, obviously they're branded differently, but they are the same meter. But what's more amusing is that I've got like over 200 CH340 chips now to do something. I don't know what I'm going to do with all these chips. I mean, they're very handy chips, but I don't remember they have a lot of use for 200 of them. I'm sure I'll find something. Maybe I'll do um, chip art or something and glue them together. Maybe I'll sculpt someone's face using the chips. I don't even know what I'm doing here. I'm sort of half deciding whether I'm going to hot air it back down or solder it back down. I'll probably solder it. Yes, no good deed goes unpunished precisely. Fortunately, at least, you know, it didn't actually 
it wasn't a penalty to me or anything like that. It was just a disappointment. Ah, for fuck's sake. And this is when my brain starts telling me, see, you should have had to edit down. It's like, yeah, whatever, I probably will now. This should really be a five second chip swap, but for some reason it's taken me quite a bit longer. Okay, one issue. I've had different multimeter brands, and the typical failure is a continue, continuity mode, which fails a lot of time. Uh, I'm not really sure why that would be. And I'll just put a great big divot into the outer casing of this. That actually is soldered down, but I'm going to add more solder for reinforcement. Yeah, Greg, I, I am glad I found the fault. At least it, you know, stopped me going insane. Hey, Hyperman. Yeah, keep him busy here. I had a couple of um, nightstand attack jobs. And I was like, really? Nightstand attack? The screen's completely shattered. I don't think it was the nightstand. Oh look, Pedro's here. Pedro scam you. I swear, Pedro, you are the one that did that um, eBay sale thing. That's exactly your type of response to someone saying, can you go a lower price? And you come back and say, sure. And you give them a higher price. That's exactly the sort of thing you would do. I mean, you're proud of it. You post it all the time that you do that crap. Hey, Tony W. Uh, you got them as well, Hyperman. Uh, what sort of success rate do you have with making them realise it was their own dumb fault for dropping it? it? It's always this far onto carpet that's like three inches plush, and it's like, no, it's not. So don't don't lie to me like that. Alright, so that one should be good. Load it back in its frame, put it back into the machine. Well, Drachen, you gotta decide, you know, this is this is adult life for for you, isn't it? You have two conflicting needs or a want and a need. And you've got to decide whether you wish to have the want override the need. Alright, clearly I can't align my ports very well. That's right. Hey Jim. Yeah, I'm certainly feeling better. They like said, um, as I messaged you the other night, you know, I was getting real close to that genuine panic phase. There were a couple of times at three, four in the morning where I had to put myself through the calming mantra sort of things to stop the anxiety running wild over me and descending into the madness of panic. It's kind of scary that after you spend a good number of years enduring panic attacks and trying to manage your anxiety and mental health, you do seem to be able to have the capacity to separate yourself from the precursor, well, from the start of a, you know, you feel it coming on and you find a way to be able to convince yourself that it is just a panic attack. And I shouldn't say just a panic attack, Rather, I should say, you know it's coming, you know it's because you're panicking, and you seem to be able to diffuse it before it gets out of hand.
or at least you try to. Sometimes it hangs on a bit too long, but oh yeah. Yeah, should be able to just plug this in. Yep, straight away, no problems with the connection. Unplug it. Yep. Plug it back in. Yeah, no dramas. See, so with the chips before, it would sometimes connect, well, then disconnect, then it would lose it. Uh, it would just be all over the place. But this, with the replacements, now works reliably. So we only got a few more of those to do. Let's see, Hyperman, fairly high success rate, saved an 11 that went, oh wow, 11 went in the washing machine, yeah, I guess that happens, okay, next one, how was Bunnings, I forgot a few things of course, but yeah, we've got door stops, Oh, that's right, that, that does remind me, I've got another project. I don't know if I'm going to have any luck with this project, but I bought a driveway alert device, you know, passive infrared thing, PIR. I'll just show it here before I get on the meter. Okay, this is just a cheap SWAN unit. Anything SWAN is basically cheap. And on the packaging it sort of mentioned doorbell and a few look on the back here you've like got melody change and the doorbell functionality whatever but I didn't see the little asterisk which said requires additional equipment i.e. the doorbell tunes and activity only works for a doorbell unit it doesn't actually work for the PIR system now the reason why that's a problem for me Maybe I'll dem no, I'll just tell you why. With the PIR unit, when you activate it, this thing goes off like a siren. It's like, rah, 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 yeah, and it's it's loud. It's great. It's fantastic. I love that it's loud. Yeah, you know, it's got a, so, a you know, genuine speaker in there and everything. But that's not what I want. I want it to just do the doorbell noise or something a little less um, traumatic. The cats hate it. When they hear the siren sound, they go helter skelter. But there's no way to get it so that when this gets triggered that this does a doorbell or some other alternate sound it is locked on being the siren only and i've tried all different programming techniques and whatnot and anyway you can't do it so what i'm going to try and do is either find a way if this thing does accept doorbells like it as an optional extra they must have a slightly different code that they transmit, some prefix code or something like that, that allows this to differentiate between the PIR versus a doorbell. But I have a horrible feeling it's all hard baked in and I'm not going to be able to change it. There's no alternate triggering system that lets me, you know, it doesn't send one line up high for a doorbell and one line up high for um, for the PIR. The only difference might be that I might have a chance on is that these diodes are for the PIR and this one here might be just for the doorbell. And I might be able to find a way of rerouting out of that back into something else, but I doubt it. Yeah, so it could be $20 down the drain. It's great as a alarm system but I don't want it as a driveway sense. I mean, you don't want a freaking... Someone's invading your home on the driveway. You know, a normal driveway alert system. Yeah, so it's... I'm a bit annoyed with that. My bad. I should have read the fine print. It can get a little tricky to read the fine print when you're in the middle of Bunnings. And you don't have your glasses with you. And I need a bigger screwdriver. It's a nuisance trying to screw these out.
Unfortunately, I took half of my uh, toolbox down with me to Townsville yesterday because I had to do a 1932 battery swap. Oh, I'm going to need that one out. Yeah, I was doing a battery swap and so I just took the whole toolbox basically, threw it in there. But no, I do have a better screwdriver for this, you know, the next size up, but oh, it looks like we're going to have to keep on with this one. Ah. Yeah, Miles, I don't know if we want the hello, welcome tone. <laughs> Uh, what's geek asking? Need to replace some surface mount components on a MacBook. I have the schematics, but flexible review. Yeah, just use open board view. Ah. That's what it's there for. That's why I say on the flex board view site, if you are just doing this for a one off job or you're not commercial, just use open board view. It's there, it works, support it, use it. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, Jim, it's actually both. I just want activity in the driveway. And I've had them before. And they work great. The only hiccup with this one, this one, it really works great. It picks up you know, the motion, whether I'm walking or a car is moving in there. The problem is just the alarm. Anyway, if I can't bodge that one to do what I want, I'll just go get another one. It's fine. They're so cheap, and I just get them locally. I'm just more frustrated that I got caught out with not reading the fine print. I did at least get some nice doorbell ones. Yeah, there's no shortage of driveway alarms and all that. It was more a case of I'm just sitting here annoyed by the fact that I got caught out by thinking that had the option to be on alarm or on more of a doorbell noise. Like I said, I might be able to hack it, or I might not. It'll make for an interesting project, if nothing else. The really crude way I could go about it is just simply to remove the speaker and then just detect the LED activity. And when I see the LED activity, I then drive the speaker with my own little Arduino, I didn't say that, my own little AVR board. I should do it using a tiny... Oh, you know, actually I can do that now that I think about it. I can do that. I've got my remote alarms, my low voltage alarms, so all I have to do is simply trigger that pin and no, that, that's going to be a piece of, I'm not going to say what the word we normally say is, but um, yeah, that's going to be a piece of cake. That's a better word to use, Paul. Good job, saved yourself there. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll make it so that we just read the LED status and then we will... Um, to drive the speaker ourselves. Piece of cake. Pop fix, that's a good idea. Yeah, we'll call it that. Ed Rodrigo. Oh, six skills here. Yeah, Miles, I don't believe in the Arduino. I think it's a solution that was never needed. Hey, Dr. Electro PC. You know, if I managed to bodge fix this, um, 
driveway alarm. I might even get some respect from Dave Jones. Not likely. Nah. He doesn't believe in us Queenslanders. He thinks we're all a bunch of um, weirdos. We don't even speak proper English up here. Okay, schematics. Do the plug-in. Perfect. What's the Africa? I'm not going to say that, Tony. Actually, where I usually get in trouble is when I just freely start calling out your mother is a in Afrikaans, and um, I'm not going to say what the last word is, but it's just a little bit too natural for me to yell it out and because basically nobody around here is Afrikaans no one knows what I'm saying it's a little bit naughty but it's one of those bad swearing habits you get into that you shouldn't have see Dave Jones has a fast leak on one of his EV tires and no spare tire it was probably the nightstand that stabbed his tire Yes, your mother's a saint, that's the one, yeah. Okay, another one fixed up. I do like the way that they actually... This is why I like these meters, well, amongst other things. First thing is it's got four AA batteries, so you've got a lot of power there, that's great. Second is the USB module is just so easy to replace. Third is that physically they stand up very well, they've got a good back stand, so um, yeah, they don't fall over when you change modes. Fourth is that the USB plug is a mini USB and the cable can just be a very light cable, so it doesn't push your meter around. I hate it when you plug in things, uh, cables, and they start dictating where your equipment goes. It's like HDMI cables can be bad for that. Hey, Bill. Baby monitors. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, I think I saw that. Yeah. Alright, so that's another one fixed. We've only got four more to go. And if we can get through this, then I will um, see what we can do about that alarm system. Oh, I think we can make that work. Assuming I can remember how to program my old boards. I'm sure I will. Even if I have to write the code again from scratch. Hey, John Finn. Joshua Bell. No, this is not um, a response to an L. If an L can't work out how to do that, then well, that's an L's problem. The only reason why I give support to Lewis Rossman when he has issues is because you know, he's got exposure leverage on me. But for anyone else, it's like, yeah, they can suffer on their own. I find it's better to let people wallow in their sort of, um, yeah, when they can't solve something. I like to let people simmer in it for a while because more often than not, once people realize that help's not coming straight away, they will often try and sort it out themselves and lo and behold, they do work out how to solve it themselves, which means that forevermore I'll not have to solve that problem for them. You gotta learn how to be a little bit cruel so that people can learn how to do things themselves. Yes, adversity builds some character, also some knowledge.
because it is very easy to fall into that trap of just simply asking people to answer your questions I mean I do it myself it's like the intelligent part of my brain just switches off and I go into please bro mode if someone gives me an answer a little too easily and I'm like oh cool that was easy the brain says let's do that again with something else and then before you know it you've got no idea how to pull a MacBook apart Yeah, tough love results in you remembering things. But as I said, when it comes to Lewis, sometimes I've got to I've got to respond to the baby screams. Otherwise, he may just throw himself out of the cot. Please send an email for me on the second item the package is sent. Okay, which one? Is that the ESR or the containers? The um, plastic jar of things. Container, right, okay. Hey, this one's faulty. Did I put the right chip back on or did I put the old one back on? Oh, it might have just been... No, definitely having issues with this one. Yeah, it's having trouble enumerating that. Makes me wonder whether I put the right chip back on. I'm most certain I did. Yeah, it looks legit. But it's definitely given me the enumeration issues that I was experiencing with the... So this one doesn't... <coughs> oh man, I cannot talk today. This one does not have the green stripe on it, which is a pencil mark from the originals. Is that it? That's no, just a piece of hair. This is why I go through and check every one that I do. Because I don't want to be sending out a meter that's not going to work. Particularly because a lot of these open board data packages are going overseas. So I don't want to have to be paying double freight. Well, the old ones have a green stripe on them. See this green crayon mark? So that's how I was knowing that it probably wasn't well wow, it's not enumerating at all weird let's try another one I mean another one that we know that works that's fine 
Hold on. Something's wrong with this one, something different. I'll just spray the contacts on the inside. Get a circuit board cleaner. Uh, Sonia, I'll just send you one. Ach, nee, man. Actually, it doesn't really matter, so long as it's a meter that... Well, it's one of the meters that I've written software for. Okay, what am I missing here? What the hell is going on? There's not a lot that can really go iffy with this circuit. You've got your crystal and you've got your chip. Not much else. I'll get a, um, one of the cables. Ah. box of these cables they're actually for the keyboard capture unit not for the multimeter the multimeter comes with its own cable <coughs> but um, we also need one for the keyboard capture unit you seem to have a spare USB up there it says likely no Uh, this one's <clears throat> got me a little bit confused. I did notice that... Yeah. Alright, I'll try from a different selection of chips that I've got floating here. I'll actually take one out of the tube. Because really there's very little that could go wrong on these boards. Yeah, Miles, I, basically all my projects, if I have to have a compact USB interface, it will be USB mini. It's actually a robust one rather than the damn micro one. And you don't really save that much room going to the micro. I mean, you save a little bit, and I suppose in the world of tenths of a millimeter it matters but uh, overall I didn't really find it was worth the weakness and issues I mean sure the the micro USB is certainly more prevalent more people have got the cables and all that sort of stuff but mini really should have been a bit more popular on devices that um, needed a bit of robustness. I suppose what didn't help is when they moved to the USB 3 standard for data transfer, they stuck the additional uh, additional connector on the side to make that wide micro USB connection. And that probably sealed the fate of the Mini. Yeah, both legs of the crystal are soldered. They're, they're on the other side. They're soldered.
Yeah, and the other problem, of course, is when you get the micro A one, which is really weird because it's almost bi-directional when you put a mini, uh, a micro B in it, but it's not. It just breaks the tongue. Uh, let's try this now. Well, that works fine. Okay, it seems to be that particular variant of the chip is a problem. Uh, if you have a look at the chip design physically, because that works fine now. It seems to be the ones that look like... Where is it? These ones. These ones here. Ah. With the broad dimple on it. Yeah, those broad dimple ones seem to be the real culprits. I'm kind of curious now with the little dimple ones are okay. Mind you, that doesn't make sense because I've got a lot of little dimple ones and I know they were definitely faulty. Yeah, so those two broad dimple ones definitely aren't working. Alright, we'll just replace another one and see how that goes. So it can be so f very frustrating when you're trying to replicate someone else's circuit and they may have just by freak chance picked the right variation of that particular chip that works for their project but all the other variations of it will not work. That happens a little too often in life. Broad dimple bear batch, possibly bad or fake? I mean, mind you, you know, who would create fake CH340 series? I mean, they're already so cheap. At Miles, I did a micro to C conversion on my Logitech K830. Oh. Okay. And I presume it worked. still not the greatest fan of the USB-C connector. I would have preferred it to be physically more like the lightning connector. Just in terms of durability. But, yeah, it's what we've got now, so... Yeah. Can't always win everything. Inspector 12, okay. <laughs> Dingle Dodger, yeah, I don't know. Could be either. I didn't bother to check to see what it reported as. So, okay, so the one that we just installed that we're happy with that has a firmware of 263 whereas the dodgy ones are 254 no that's a good one actually 254 no, no that's 254 no. oh well Alright, we've got three to go. Hopefully we can find some consistency in our form before we get to the end. The OBD2 connector. I don't know that one. OBD2. Is that um, onboard diagnostics for cars? Yeah, I would really don't want to see iPhones switch to USB-C. I don't even know if they can. I don't know what the accessory support would be like. But yeah, the USB-C uh, plug tongue. Oh, sorry, inner port tongue. Yeah.
And the fact that you've got twice as many connectors, uh, little pins, in the plug. Now I suppose you can counterpoint that and say, well, yeah, the plug's dead easy to replace, which is true. I think the bigger problem might be coming from, funnily enough, the likes of Apple MacBooks and such, where the physical holding, the shroud holding of the USB-C is very lackluster at best. And so it feels just sloppy. And I hate that sloppy connector feel. I mean, HDMI is so bad for that too. There, there probably are better standards for the HDMI. You know, standards, physical standards that have a, uh, a superior tolerance for the shell and things like that. You don't find it too often and implemented. And it's one thing to have standards, it's another to actually have them implemented. Alright, so we've got a um, small dimple one here. I'm kind of curious, I'm going to plug this in and see how it behaves. Hey Derek Chan. Now this doesn't work, this does not even come up. So, yeah. So like I'll show you the... Okay. So like, disconnect. Oh, it just started to consider connecting then. See, plugging it in, nothing. Nada, 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 nada. If we get, say, one that we, I think we just did. See, so immediately connects. So I love the fact that the factory is trying to tell me that these work just fine. Does this? Okay. See? Error, 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 error. It's not just fine. That doesn't work. So we're now going to change that chip and see what happens. So it might have been those broad dimple ones came from my stock. So maybe, and they were loose ones in the packet. They were not part of the tube sets. So I don't know, maybe there were some dodgies. Anyway, you can see this one's green striped. So that is genuinely factory. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah. Miles, it'll be interesting to see how Apple deals with the European regulations then, because if the European regulation decides not everything's got to be USB-C, I'm kind of, yeah, I'm curious to see how Apple counters that. I guess it would be in their financial interest to bribe, so to speak, the council. A few tens of million would be worth it. Okay, so this is one of mine. Personally, I don't think Apple should be forced to have to do that. I mean, I understand that they're trying to reduce waste and things like that, and Apple themselves are pretty god-awful when it comes to environmental good behavior, stewardship, but I still don't think that they should be forced to have to rescind the lightning connector. Apple just go with the wireless charger. You see, I mean, and then that leaves us in an even bigger hell then. So that's the problem. It's like you get these groups that try to do the, the nice thing and all it does is just makes companies skew around a different way and we end up with an inferior result overall. Okay, plug it in. You don't tell me that you're not working, you son of a... Alright, I'm genuinely going to lose my nuts soon. Oh, that works.
if lightning wasn't proprietary, I wonder if C would happen. It probably still would have, would have rather, mostly because a lot of companies will create alternate standards simply because it's, well, two things. We don't want to be Apple. We don't want to follow Apple and not invented here syndrome, which I suppose is the same thing. I just noticed my face cam's a little overblown. Yeah, I need to get a better front light on my face. The uh, failed to query thing here, that's me manipulating the camera. Okay, so yeah, this is a 263, so... So these chips actually do have a different build variant to what I originally thought they were going to be. Because the first couple of samples that the guy sent me who... Oh, shoot. Yeah, from all of these, they were all the 254, the initial samples. But it looks like it's a legitimate mixed bag. Yeah, anyway, we'll see how we go. Miles, are you saying your money's on firmware issues with the actual chip? Because yeah, I mean, I'll be going for that myself. 264 seems to be the one that really does not work. Yeah, probably a good number. Good thing I've got 200 of them. Now yeah, this straight up, no problems. I've got to also be careful that I'm not misinterpreting Linux being slack about assigning the um, USB device versus, particularly if it's had a run of errors on that port, you know, maybe sort of like saying, I'm going to wait around a little bit before I try enumerate this one again. Oh, sorry, I just realised I wasn't even connected. Yeah. Yeah, it's another one done. Two to go. Certainly everyone that has failed seems to be a 264. See you, Sonia. Will do. Ah, oh, this is... I gotta get a screwdriver that can do the job. See if it does any better. Funnily enough, this is almost equally as awkward, but at least I can 
get a little more pressure, you know, downward pressure on it. It's like a, I don't know, it's halfway between pH 1 and pH 2 on the Phillips. So what is this? Yeah, this is pH 1. But if I go pH 2, then the holes are generally a little bit too big for this. Uh, the shaft is usually too big for the holes. So we just have to use pH 1 and then a bunch of force. Ah, Rodrigo. That's probably because I've eliminated most of the, the frustrating people. And we still do get the occasional moron coming in, stirring up strife. So we have one more of these to do after this one, and then we'll have a shot at reworking that driveway system. Personally, I would consider it a massive overkill, what I'm going to do to it, but... And I mean, for the price, it's a bit of a waste, so... That'll be fun, I hope. And someone didn't put enough flux down, so this is going to... Oh, we got lucky. Normally without enough flux there, those... Making those pads would tend to... Um, sort of Hershey kiss them a bit. Oh, Nell is in here. Yeah, Mel. I hear you're having troubles with multimeter... Um, display... In your stream. Some people suggested I should have helped, and I suggested that you should just, you know, man up and use your brain a bit more. All good, Mark. It's not a MacBook. Oh wow, here comes the spammers. Someone's messaging me. Yep, 263, and that works perfect. Okay. So another one improved. Let's give that a wash. Okay. I was about to put flux on there for washing it. Yeah, that, that really would work spectacularly well. <laughs> one very slimy circuit board. Hey GD Tech, good morning. Is GD Tech supposed to be goddamn? I'm assuming. Exclamative Tech. Yeah. 
driving the screws back in if this is okay. In fact, it's kind of better because it stops you from overdriving the screw. And because these just go into plastic standoffs, then it's best not to overdrive. You split the standoff and it's, it's the end of the road. You can repair them, but it's no fun. That's weird now, this one's giving me grief. What the hell's going on here? And that's a two six. Uh, this is driving me up the wall. Okay, I'll just check, maybe it's my USB. It's frustrating, I do not have enough USB ports. I have got several hubs and yet somehow I still manage to run out of ports. Yeah, just disconnecting the barcode scanner. Oof. Plug in the three way USB port. See if thing, seeing if it stays stable. It's staying stable this time. Alright. Okay, last one to go. <sighs> It's got a different wrap on it, this one. They can't even remain consistent within the, the batch of devices. Uh, that's a Duratool, uh, same as the others. What's your USB device number count? Oh, I'm at to 65 at the moment. Funnily enough, this one's actually, this one's behaving okay, and it's a 264. I'm going to leave it there for a little bit. Uh, now, th that is the case with all of them, I believe, all of them from the factory. I'm pretty sure the power tech ones I've got also come with the batteries. Now this one's actually stable. Very unusual. Uh, this is the... Basically it's the same meter. Peak meter. And Duratec, they changed the brand on it. That's about all. Oh, the battery's encrypted. Ha ha ha. Funnily enough, it is a bit of an interesting thing that this whole battery's encrypted thing ended up being a bit of a hysteria response turns out it is just the same as with the existing iPhone batteries where if you don't have a genuine one it will complain but aside from that you know it's not a major issue and I think when we get these hysteria events it actually is very damaging for our industry so I do wish that people producing those videos would take a little bit of extra time to eliminate 
you know, to make sure they know what they're saying is actually correct. Hey GD Tech, uh, program my multimeter software. It's been a while since I programmed something, but let's see what I can do. Which meter have you got? Yeah. Yeah, but the thing is, what the complaint was is that it wouldn't even boot. Like, if it. That was the original thing. If you don't have the genuine battery, it's not going to boot. But it turned out that's not the case. And the trouble is the damage is done because now you're playing forever catch up with that far front because there's always going to be someone who hears that information first and you know pushes it ahead spreads it around before they themselves are updated to find out that, that is not the case But most of the time it's always, lately now, well not lately, but it just seems to be a case of everybody's vying to be the first to do the teardown or the first to find the problem and things like that. And I, I think it's great that there is that intensity and you know, competitiveness, but at the same time there needs to be responsibility. But who am I kidding? No one ever does that. Okay, maybe there's no batteries in this one. Yeah, it must be, it must have been just the Duratec ones have the batteries and these ones don't. Yeah. Oh well, not that I would trust those batteries to last more, very long. And I'm throwing away these, I will put them in the package, but we're not, you're not going to have to use those horrible, horrible leads. I'm going to replace these leads with these. Uh, these are good quality Hirschman. They're the same ones that I use. And I think the best part about these is actually the alligator clips. They're fantastic alligator clips. And you know, you've got these pro points that are quite spiky. Just tell my fingers. Ask my fingers, I should say. They know. So yeah, I will throw them in, but... Or maybe... Oh, I can't decide. It's probably 100, 150 grams of extra weight and it might push the packages over a certain weight limit. We'll see. Yeah, interesting. No batteries in that one. Alright. Well, I'm going to replace this one anyway, just to add an abundance of caution. I probably don't have to, but I'm going to do it. Yeah, no, I don't know why manufacturers bother. I guess they've got to include something. I will say, at least with these Duratec meters, I am happy that I got them at a discounted price. Because I basically bought all their stock. What was remaining in the um, existing shipment. Well, then I ended up finding them cheaper in China anyway through AliExpress. So for future, for future open board data project capture kits, I'll just be getting the ones from AliExpress, the power tech meters, and yeah, people can supply their own batteries. For batteries, I like to use the Eneloop uh, Pro Double A's anyway. You get a much longer life 
particularly if you are doing mostly things like diode and continuity mode it does drain the batteries pretty a fair bit gee whiz the um, yeah, that needs to be redone that crystal that leg those legs are not going through that's interesting they um, are just floating there fantastic Greg how much do they cost there for the inner loops I mean they're not the cheapest here either but it's Wait, there's existing legs in there? What the hell? There's old legs in there. There are old legs. They do not belong to that crystal. Or maybe they did and they broke. <laughs> That's crazy. I'm going to have to dig those out. Now they just look like a pair of Android memories. Okay, the legs are out. 45 for a set of what, 4 or 8? Can you even still get the non-pro ones, the white ones? Because they would last perfectly well too. It's a little distressing seeing the crystal having been second soldered onto the $45 Panasonic Analute 4th Gen Oh, okay, so it's an 8-pack, that's fine, yeah no, well, I think for an 8-pack, that's pretty good price, actually. I mean, I would buy it at that price. Alright, so we've got a bit of a problem here, that this crystal, the legs are just a little bit short. So kind of have to bend it, but with these can crystals, you don't want to bend them too much. They do not like the junction between the case and the legs to be used as a fulcrum point as it were so you kind of got to I'm probably overthinking this but it's easy to mess up crystals because you relied on that um, piece of bakelite under the bottom of the can as the point where you bend the legs from uh, Now I just look like a drunk walker. That is a serious drunk walker. We'll get that one, this leg in, and see what we can do about the other. Oh, well, there's that spam again, folks. If you missed out on the first time, now's your opportunity. Ach, niemand. I'll just make a plan and work my way through it. Okay, make a plan. Erica cleaning up cat people. How delightful. Somebody's got to do it. You can expect the cats won't. I'm kind of overdoing this. Here we go.
Um, I'm not gonna, these aren't being sold, these packages. These packages are already pre-funded through the Right to Repair initiative through Rossman. I'm just simply putting in the work to put them together and distribute them out. But yeah, they're already funded. And I'm fairly sure I've allocated all of them now. But there may be another batch put out, depending on how much data we can get. If we can show that it was a success and we pick up uh, pick up some good data for the systems, then yeah, they may give us another round of funding. If on the other hand it turns out to be a bit of a dud, then yeah, we won't get more funding. Hey Thomas Bulver. I know it's an overkill, but I'm just over filleting those. Oops. Looks like I got struck by an earthquake then. Uh, Derek Chan, the reason why they don't pour copper in that is because it costs more money. And remember, these are being built down to the absolute minimum price possible, so therefore copper pour costs money. Now yeah, that's all good. 263 and working fine. Because if there's one thing that a lot of the Chinese manufacturers and designers are exceptionally good at, and that is being able to shave the cost of these things right down, they can find truly mysteriously marvelous ways of cutting costs. In <laughs> you just you look at it and you kind of go, okay, well it works, that's amazing, and I don't even know how you came up with that idea, but it does work. Although usually by work it's typically in a far narrower or smaller operating envelope but that doesn't matter so long as it works at standard temperature and pressure that's all good okay yeah, that's it all the meters are done I just need to clean up the train wreck that I've created on the floor here. I will go through and individually test them though. Just organising the boxes so I don't trip over them too much. This was all supposed to be done about two weeks ago, and it, as usual, didn't happen. Derek Chain, depends on what uh, process they're using for the etching. Like, I think most of them just use heated, um, well, actually I don't really know for sure. But I know often they can use cupric chloride or something like that. And they just simply revitalize the etchant. So the etchant really is more of a carrier. 
rather than being consumed by the process. I mean, I'm sure they've done the numbers. That's the thing. They've probably done the numbers and they know what's the most economical option for them. Hey, Jan Zimmy. Yeah, if they save a tenth of a cent, they will save a tenth of a cent. It's all a saving. What is it? A penny saved is a penny earned or something like that? I don't know. Sounds like a uh, George Washington or one of those old people type sayings. Hey Ben Wilson. But yeah, most of us are unfortunately used to dealing with things like ferric chloride and such and yeah, you know, we see the copper being consumed and the etchant get used up and things like that. But when you change over to things like cupric chloride, etchant, I think I'm pretty sure it's cupric chloride then it's more of a circular process and your main consumption then is just energy. Alright, okay well, well I guess we'll go to the next project which is can we hack job this? Kind of looks like I'm going to need some batteries. So three double A's and three triple A's. Okay. I'm probably going to end up damaging the PIR sensor at this rate. Maybe I can screw this back in before I do that. I don't think I know what I'm doing. Ah, right. Does that line up? Okay, that lines up. Cool. I guess the question is where did I put the batteries? Oh, not where I put the screws in the over here. The screws seem a little large. Okay, that's an acceptable fit. Honestly, I really should berate myself more often while I'm disassembling these things because I tend to take a bit of a cavalier approach and just like, yeah, I'll remember where the screws go. And naturally, of course, you never do. Or you wonder where you put the screws. Yeah. It's interesting, they've got a code button here, but I suspect what this code button does is it just simply randomizes the um, suffix digits or whatever. It randomizes the idea of this and nothing more. I don't think it does anything more intelligent than that. And then what happens is you re-bind it with this one. So there is some level of intelligence in terms of understanding the IDs that are transmitted by these devices, but it's not overly sophisticated. I mean, this is just 433 megahertz transmitter stuff. It's a very useful thing, these 433 units. And you can get about you know, 10k a second out of them for data. Ah, Pedra. I hate ferrochloride, yeah. Sodium perchlorate and things like that I much prefer. Prettier too, and you can actually see what's happening with your etch. So the red eye of the PIR senses you.
Now these things don't usually take up a lot of power so I can just screw this back together and it should be fine for the purpose of what we're going to be doing. Yeah. I think the worst thing about PIRs is trying to get the damn things to activate when you want them to. They almost never do. It's always when you don't want them to. Alright, so the transmitter's good. Get some two more double A's. Which I have. Uh, oops charged up to others. These are inner loops but they're the standard inner loop. Okay. Scared now. Okay, that should be mute, I think. No, nope, that's not mute. Alright, <laughs> that's the really frustrating thing, I can't, it won't let me switch over to a, um, what do you call it, anything but that tune, that tune is all I've got. Interesting it's still blinking. It actually takes a while to stop blinking, interesting. It's almost like that's decaying away. Yeah, it's just some fancy hack job that decays away. Anyway, so we can't stop that. We can't, um, I mean, okay, other than, okay, so that now should be silent, I hope. What? Why did that change on me? Stupid son of a bitch. Something is a little wonky here. See how slow it's running? Yeah, PIR rage for sure. Okay, maybe the batteries are a bit weak. I should have been charged. Well, at least two of them are charged. Come back here. 1.27. So this one. Damn it. That one there's the non-charged, I think. Yeah, 1.39, 1.39, and minus 1.27. Okay, unfortunately, I, my battery charger doesn't do single cells. So what we'll do is we'll steal candy from the baby. And these are analog pros, but we only need one. See if we've got anything better on this cell. 1.28. Well, you're not much better. In fact, you're worse. Also 1.28. Great. Mouse batteries are on the verge of collapse. Like my sanity. I'm just putting them in the charger and I'm going to go grab some other batteries.
Yeah, that's better. 1.36. Really not a fan of devices that need three batteries. In some ways, I wish they would just go uh, all out and say, look, you know what, we need four and we're going to regulate it down. <laughs> because three batteries is such an awkward number when you're trying to charge or buy enough. You sort of end up needing at least 12 batteries. Okay. I can't remember it's supposed to be two or one. Damn it. Maybe one. Maybe I'm supposed to press this one. Yeah, it's definitely not that one. It is not behaving how it should. Something's gone wonky. Probably because of me. See that? I must be misaligned somewhere. It does have a manual, but the manual is about as useful as me. So. Ah, uh, Joseph's been the pun king today. How appropriate for Halloween. The pun king. Well, here's the easiest way. We'll just disconnect the speaker. <laughs> uh, but we kind of need it. And the antennas. Look at the chip numbers and see if I can find anything useful out of them. Most of these chips you can't do squat with. Greg, it's a company called Swan, but they're really just a rebadger. They don't really do anything useful. SXDO43B. This is the 433 module. These chips are pretty common, the PT4303s. Um, all you have here basically is. Um, this is the data pin and this is the enable pin. So you just get whatever data is coming off the transmitter comes out through here. Say delta, I don't know what they're going to queue for, some sort of buffering configuration. And it's coming into this chip here, which will probably be some sort of write once programmable chip NT620M can't find anything on that oh wait what have we got most of no that's just a random okay 2042 yeah no idea of what most of these chips are going to do. Does that net mill? ATM? There would no way they'd put ATM seal 902. That is a flash chip that contains data on it. I wonder if we can read what's on that. I don't know. Let's see, 2402. That's not a very big one. It probably doesn't need a lot. That could be holding the codes for whatever you program the device for. 
uh, for when you resynchronize. I would say that's probably what that's for. And it is talking back to this chip, yeah. Bugger. LM4, what is that? 4890, that'll be the speaker amp, I'm guessing. Yeah, it will be so this here. I bet you that there goes, yeah, it'll be the speaker. So that's the speaker amp. SXD 043B. Oh, that's a... Yeah, okay. Apparently there's something on Reddit about it. Okay, SXD043 seems to be something to do with audio. Not quite sure. Maybe it's the tune chip, like for the doorbell tunes. And I've noticed in another controller they've got an NT200M. So that basically, this also being an NT type chip, that's probably a yeah, right once programmable chip. See, the NT200M pulls the PT4303C high briefly every second. We had, if the data sample from the 4303... Yeah, so the SXD is like the tune chip. Yeah, Greg, that um, that first line you posted up there, the indoor alarm receiver provides a choice of 16 different chimes. You can't use them, though, because we don't have a doorbell unit. Yeah, any triple five, you want to tell me how we're going to do that? Because you're right, that is one option. It would be the default tune as well. Decide to use a playback line, blah, 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 both volume charge, we'll playback. Yeah, the question is which one, how do you get it to do it? The other problem is going to be is if the alarm is not actually part of the tune chip, if the alarm is in fact driven by that um, NT chip. Let's see, red, ground, blue, trigger. This is the audio out. Yeah, it'd be nice if you could just simply force this chip, as Greg's saying, to only output for the um, doorbell team. But I am worried that this chip will be creating the alarm noise as part of its code. I suppose one way we can test that theory is to actually remove this chip and see if it will still do the alarming. Uh, let's see. The other way is I should look at the pinout for this audio amp. And these are only single side boards. So uh, yeah, maybe Greg's idea might actually work. Uh, LM4890. Oh, it's a one watt power amplifier. That's pretty cool. That's quite amazing that they can cram one watt of output into that tiny chip. Uh, 
Damn it, press the wrong button. Story of my life. Okay, schematics. Okay, so I see. So I'm going to do a quad view here. I don't know if that's going to work. Yeah, that's good enough. That'll work. Okay, so we've got... This is a shutdown. Okay, interesting. Shutdown pin. And these are the inputs. That's kind of weird. We've got... Unless that's coming through the... Alright, I guess a single channel. <coughs> relative to ground. So that there is input. Capacitor decoupled. So what's this pin here then? Yellow is audio out. Okay, so that is audio out. Capacitor decoupled. 20k resistor. I'm guessing that's a 3k. To... Okay, weird. 3k. Oh, it must be feed. That'll be feedback, right? Yep. Yeah, in minus and yeah, VO, so output. Okay, we do have VO2. Okay, so right, alright, so output and output land there. Audio amps are not my speciality. Yeah. Alright, so it's a push pull driver configuration. So B class. And it's interesting, they've actually pretty much copied this. So if we look at, you've got the 20k input, and they've got the 20k resistor there, so that's that. So that's probably going to be what they've got there, 390 nanofarad. Uh, I'm not sure why they've got the 1k resistor here to ground, but I guess it's just part of the biasing. I am curious with this 303... Okay, they've done a slightly different on the feedback. The feedback on the schematic is 20k, this one's 3k. No, it's not. This is 30k. Alright, so it's less feedback. They don't want to amp it as high, I guess. Okay, so that's pretty much as per schematic. This is why half the time when Apple says they've invented something, most of the time it's just copied from the schematic. So it's only got the one source. Okay. Well, that's a good sign. So that means how does it trigger so we need a data sheet for this SXDO43 SXDO43 data sheet and find a way for us to request only that one doorbell thing there's only that one Are you kidding me How does it know which code to play? Hmm. Alright. Well, if anyone can find me a better data sheet for this, this SXDO43B, I'd be very interested. almost might have to bring the scope out to have a look so apparently this pin here is the what do you call it trigger so let's trace this back trigger that's on the back here okay that's the tune select button I think is it oh no that's the um this button here is being used to select the volume. 
That's between that and that, those two there. Hey Richard T. Yeah, it's getting desperate if I've got to bring the scope out, I agree. Okay, this would just be VCC, yeah it is. Orange is pl orange playing, I don't know what... Okay. Alright, so orange and yellow are the audio out. I'm not sure why they've got this person's listed one as playing. Red ground, that's obvious. I'm going to take this chip off and... S so, oh, actually, no, I don't have to. I can just trace it with continuity. Just trying to see what the other pins are going from. It's like a U... This one here. Oh, no, you're just going straight under the... Alright, nothing to do with that chip. Okay, so these are all NC, 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 NC. Uh, yeah, I'm going to bring the scope out and see what happens. It's a sad day in my workshop that I've got to bring a scope out. No, I'm good, thanks. I'm just being a moron. Poor little probes have gotten a bit saggy. Yeah, someone's going to make an inappropriate joke about that. I'm going to leave... No, uh, I don't need the speaker. Just plug the speaker back in, just to make it truly annoying. Jonathan, I would agree with you. Well, Swan wouldn't have done much at all with this. They just would have said, we need something that does this. And someone would have said, here you go. And we put your, uh, put your branding on it. I love the fact that the battery compartment is about half a mil too, uh, too narrow. So you basically have to deform the plastic to get these batteries to fit in. Okay. No, do it this way. Still gonna wiggle around a bit though. These are actually the wrong sort of probes to be using for this particular task. I would have been better off with multimeter type probes, but yeah. The only trouble I'm having here is that uh, certainly the 
a bit slinky like at the moment rather than holding themselves up like I would normally want and of course we've got to get a hold of ground but unfortunately I can only get a hold of positive here so oh wait no there's a chance I can get ground elsewhere I'll probably set up the scope first rather than because I'm going to fiddle around I'll knock things best I get the scope ready oh, what's the time bill? Uh, 220, 240 okay Uh, so much dust on this thing now. Now, unfortunately, I don't really have an ability to show you what's on scope too easily. I suppose I could. Damn thing just falls over. Need some support. Soldering's a bit much. I need one of those right angle power leads. You know, the IEC leads with the right angle connector on them. Be mean to buy a few of those, but I never get around to it. SXD043B is a 10 pin 10 is the trigger right yes yeah we've um, let's see one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. yeah that one I've already identified I guess the question is how is it toggling on that trigger to make it pick the particular tune that we want let's see blue for blue even though it doesn't really matter not sure I'm going to be using two channels on this but we'll see I don't even know if this works anymore. Seems to light up. That doesn't mean squat. No, yep, it actually did work. Huh. Now the microscope's going to be. Okay, keep it in the way. You can tell this is not my normal, normal thing. And I'm stuck in that situation where this is one of the few scenarios where I would am better off using something like a five diopter desktop magnifying bench glass thingy. I've got one, but not in this room. Okay, so I need to actually raise the whole damn microscope up. This is such a literal pain. There we go. We have any luck with that? Alright, that's going to give us the range we need. Pin 10. I want to see what the audio out's like on this. Oh, uh, that one might have to sit it out. We're just going to watch pin 10. And grab ourselves a ground. What have we got? We've got red. It's channel one. I can't even see the damn screen properly now. Okay, we're on the run. Ow. 
Ouch. Okay, well, you guys can actually see what's on screen better than I can, so just tell me if you see it capture anything. Oh yeah, there we go. But it's running too fast, I need to actually capture data. God damn it, I don't know what I'm doing. Horizontal... No, that's offset. Alter division... Seconds division, okay, let's drop this back a bit. What am I set on at the moment? Damn it. The reflections are all messing me up. There we go. Okay, we'll try 200 milliseconds of division. Call Dave Jones. <laughs> yeah. Wish I could. That just looks more like it's running a square wave and nothing more. I'm just going to try something. I'm going to try and short that pin 4 trigger. To now, if it goes kablammy, you get a good view of it. No, or is it pulling it to ground? All right, that, that's weird. I only I pulled it to ground. And it the blue is running the trigger. Like I pulled I pulled blue to ground, but then when I did that, that trigger line does the square wave. I don't get it. I'm missing something here about how this is working. Missing something considerable. Well, here's a question. No. Okay, where's the other ding dong thing? I'm very much out of my depth here. Okay, uh, let's see. Use the plastic probe, Paul. That's the safe thing to probe with. I'll just say U5, that, um... Uh, move the damn thing. Oh, well, no biggie. This here, where does this go? God, this is so painful. Oh boy, it goes to an unknown point. <laughs> okay, so what does this pin actually... This is what I'm wondering. What does U5 actually do? We'll find out. Oh, not U5. I mean... Um, this pin here. Well, let's do it again. Let's trigger it. I don't even have to use the transmitter now for this. I can just do it manually. Oh wow, that um just getting close to it makes it Okay, that's weird. So why did that change?
Greg, I think what's happening is that the doorbell unit, the actual wireless doorbell unit that they supply as an optional extra, will have a different transmit ID in it. Like if we, yeah, let's, I'll show you what I mean. I really need to spend a couple of days and learn how to use this DSO properly. Anyway, um, I'm just going to make sure this doesn't fall over. I think we might put it on, no, we need it here. Okay, we're on the data output pin. Okay, cool. This is more... What's it doing? It's just picking up random trash at this point. All that is just random stuff that the uh, 433 megahertz thingy is just decoding. But I think if we shove my face in front of this, it will all of a sudden become... Yeah. That is a long data string. That one's a shorter one. Yeah. Is a YouTube video showing different streams been playing in a kit with physical doorbell? Anyway, so, well, basically what I'm sort of trying to say is that the doorbell will have some sort of code prefix or suffix in it, some sort of bits set in the data that it sends for the ID, which indicate that it's a doorbell. Now, I'd love to know what those bits are, but then I would have to change the transmitter. My bit of confusion here is why is it, it just gives me the alarm then, but when I do the trigger this way, it was giving me the doorbell. Not that. Which makes me think that that there is more of an output than it is an, I just don't know. This is why you need data sheets, folks. And what does U5 do? What's U5's current voltage status? Oh, I keep saying U5, but I mean the pin down here. And continuity mode is not a good mode to be measuring voltages in, Paul. There we go. wonder how many of my meters have died from that. Alright, so we've got 4 volts steady on this line here. Or at least I think it might be steady. It does appear to be. Yeah, 2 volts of division. What was this other pin? It's ground. Where does that go? Oh, jeez. tip marker time I'm wondering if the note selection button on that box sends a selection code to the chip it's um let's see which is it the top or the bottom button on this it's the top button isn't it yeah it's the top button on it okay the top button here so that's that there It's supposed to be part of the binding system, so it's like it's got a multi-function purpose. 
a multi-purpose function, I should say. I think it depends on how long it's been held down for. Time-based functionality is a convenient tool, but by God, it's a pain in the ass tool. All right, so that goes to this button here, right, pin. We should be able to get it to play different tunes by pulling that to ground. It will cycle through the tunes. I think I'm trying to find a real ground around here. Yeah, I've got the musical notebook, and unfortunately, it's also marked as the um, a programming binding button, which just simply confuses the issue a lot. Give me a second to see if there's a ground. Yep, and what are you? Four, okay. So now, I'm going to see if it will replicate what I'm doing when I press that button. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, it's going to cycle through all the tunes now. There are so many tunes on this chip. Yeah, I, the volume button, that's right. That's this one over here. That one there. Interestingly, that one doesn't just go to ground. That seems to go across these two here. That is actually kind of quirky. And that's also isolated. Yeah, cuckoo is appropriate, I think. Okay, four volts on that. Oops. No volts on that. Four volts on that. Alright, so basically these two are getting shorted together and they should cause the volume change. Yeah, it's causing the volume. Just the debouncing, uh, the lack of debouncing is giving me grief there. Alright, so shorting these two here together does the volume change. So this must be... Okay, so that gets pulled up if I short that. Whereas the other one pulls it down. So it's a multi-mode type input. So which one's zero on that, but we should have four on this. Yeah, we do. Okay. And zero on that. Yep. Okay, so four. Okay, maybe it's not multi mode. Maybe it's this sees four volts, it's volume change. Yeah, and if that gets pulled to ground, data sheets, data sheets. But again, we do have the question: How is it driving the siren? Because according to this little snippet of code, uh, the working that this person has done, according to that, it's um, it's not really making a lot of sense in our scenario. The pin could be both input and output, I suppose, yes. I mean, there's no harm in that. But I'm kind of curious what this line is. Uh, it's probably just 4 volts. Who's the devil? Which one? So 
So what triggers the siren? How does the siren get generated? Because it's got to, it's got to come out through this uh, audio chip. Yeah, somehow this audio chip is generating that siren out, but as far as I can tell. Unless it's driving one side, no, it still doesn't make a lot of sense. I was going to say, maybe it's driving one side for the siren and one side for the, um... Yeah, you know what, I might try bend up one pin and see what happens. So what have we got? Pin 1 and 4 are the ones of interest. So one is shut down. Now that's, that's just weird. Shut down when low. Three is the one I would have thought they would have. Uh, are they connected? It's also a little bit hard when you can't just... Because the circuit's got power in it, I don't want to do continuity tests. <laughs> Okay, U, U. I get a feeling that these two pins, well, the, the coppers there, they're connected together, they're bound together, and that is bypass and in plus. Yeah, it probably makes sense, actually. Yeah, it does, actually. I'm the, I'm the idiot there. Uh, Jim, the tune chip is SXD043B, and there's basically nothing on the internet about it that I can see. That's it there. There, they could be, yeah, they could be doing so many things, but the chip itself, I would imagine, is more simple than that. But I'm starting to think that the pins have sort of multi-mode capability like suggested you know maybe at certain voltage levels they do different things I'm just trying to better understand the output network here so this here appears to be the main audio drive like, you know, we're going to pin 4 which is in negative and in positive just goes yeah, back to bias This is the trouble is, because they're so good at minimizing the cost of building these things, this is where they create these amazing quirks or they exploit some maybe not necessarily documented behavior of certain chips to make them do interesting things. It'd just be nice to know how they're getting it to even make that siren noise, because as far as I can tell, there's no siren noise really on that chip, I think. Or maybe there is. Maybe we just haven't cycled through enough of them. Okay, let's do this again. I don't know what we're up to. Yeah, listen out to see if there's a siren on it. No. So many frickin' leprechauns on this chip.
And we're back to the start. Try lifting pin six. Yeah, let's see. Let's, let's, uh, change the pin six, one, two, three. This one here, yeah, that's what I was wondering about, that one there. Why is it doing what it's doing? Because that's the, um, was it? yeah, it's a shutdown pin. So that's why I'm kind of wondering what, they, what they're doing with that, how to do it. It seems to go into the BIOS section, not BIOS, BIAS. And so I don't know how, yeah, maybe they're sending through a phase shifted version of the tune that they're putting out in order to get it to go to siren yeah i think i'm going to go with uh, that suggestion yeah lifting up pin six Right. I was wondering why I was taken down, and then I realised I actually need to out oh, get the battery out. Messing with the doorbell because it doesn't have a feature that I actually want. It doesn't let me change the. It's got a siren for the proximity sense rather than just the doorbell that I want. And the problem is that we can't, well at least I haven't found, uh, the actual siren tune on the chip. But everything seems to come from this chip. So they're doing something with that, whatever tune it's generating, in order to get it to do a siren. So yeah, some kind of phase shifted XORD version, I don't know, I'm talking gibberish here. I should start writing movie plots. Or criminal CSI investigator stuff. They always come up with this bollocks that they talk about. That is too awkward. I'm going to have to use a spatula to get that out. So a little more lift and then I will wick away that solder. Okay, now I can wick it. And try reversing the polarity. <laughs> then if I replace, reverse the polarity, it will probably make me start making siren noises. Now, I don't know how that bias is going to go, because that is a free-floating line now. So that's going to be really weird. It may have to be tied to ground. Not sure. Anyway, let's see how it goes. I think we can get rid of the scope. Sorry, scope. You, you're nothing more than just a visual feast. But you didn't actually do anything useful. Uh, I suppose it did do something useful. It showed us that that uh, trigger pin was in fact more complicated than a simple on-off. So for that I guess we're thankful. Yeah, visual prop. Made it look lo more legitimate. Although for that you really need the old tube uh, CRO type ones, um, yeah, tube scopes. Alright, so we're back to life. Time to see if we get the alarm. Now we get nothing. So it's, it knows there's something happening, but we're not getting any output. So I don't know whether we should tie that to ground or something. Let's do that. And then try it to VCC and do that. Let's see.
crow, damn it, yes. <laughs> I used to have a crow. Oh, this is still on. Whoops. Try triggering t pin 10 with. What's pin 10 again? 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oh, right. Alright. Very sensitive now. Yeah, nothing. I think the problem is because it's floating, it doesn't know whether to enable or not. Floating pins are not good things. Where'd my wire go? If I'm, I can't zoom out a bit, it's as far as I can go. Anyway, we're going to focus on this task first, this attempt, before we get distracted chasing other rabbits down the hole. Someone's taking my flux. Where'd my flux go? Yeah, then the uh, tri-state inputs. Alright, so... Right, that's set to ground. Mind you, in this case, the audio amp chip does not have that option anyway. Alright, well that's um, interesting. It's not producing anything again. Hmm. Alright, what if... What if that bias pin is actually modulating a fixed square wave or something? Mind you, if it was modulated in fixed square wave, it should... Oh, well, I suppose we should actually still try put this bias pin to input high. Yeah, Def Pum, I'm not going to yet show that up. Sorry, buddy, I'm working on this current process. So something we all learn is that you have to wait your turn to get your chance. And I can't zoom out any further. This is, that's as far as it goes. That's as far as it goes. Okay, I'm going to put this to high. Just 
pin six on this. Hopefully, don't cause any shorts or jeans. Did I do that with the battery? For oh, shite. I just did that with the battery connected. God damn it. But I bet you the doorbell still runs. Ow, that hurt actually. Alright, so it appears that that pin 6 doesn't seem to really do anything other than the fact that it just enables or disables the chip. Probably just stop it maybe, picking up noise. Bugger. Alright, well at least we eliminated one option. Put that pin back down. Okay, oh yeah, Def Palm, I'll just give you an over overview. Okay. Now this unit generates like 16 tones of doorbell. Out of those 16 tones, none of them appear to be the siren. But the audio chip going off to the speaker with a piece of junk in it. That is the only path and its audio inputs are coming from the chip there. Now you're kind of curious, what happens if I lift pin 5? I don't imagine much, but it's um, yeah, kind of curious. Yeah, so anyway, so the siren would appear to have to be generated out of this somehow. But like I said, we can't find that in a tune. And also, we can select, you know, by toggling, pulling this to ground, we can change which tune it's going to hold, which I believe is probably just being held in here at least in theory but then somehow it generates a siren on demand which means I'm thinking it must take the tune that is playing and somehow mix it in with itself to produce a siren what does that unpopulated R24 do? Uh, let's see, R24, capacitor, so that will be a V plus rail of some sort, which is, it comes up here, and goes into yeah, another, it's some sort of rail. And funnily enough, it, it doesn't really matter because it's coming off here anyway. It, the copper is connected straight there, R27. So they are actually already connected. So you get power input, supposedly audio output based on what we're seeing for the data sheet for this. And this line here is the um, input bias select, which appears to just be pulled high when it wants to generate out. What the tricky bit is, is this, we can trigger the siren by pulling this low, and we can change the volume by setting this high, I think it was, okay, that's B plus, so something in here tells it how to do it, 
I wonder if we can, wonder if it's a polarity shift. Maybe if I pull that to ground, I can't pull that to ground because if I pull that to ground, that's a low impedance line. It'll probably fry, I think, is it? Oh no, this is just the on off buttons, right? Wait, so how the hell does this even get told to make the alarm? Yeah, how does this get even told? I'm just going to pull that chip and see if there's... I can't see any traces I'm missing unless this one taps out somewhere. Probably going to melt the living daylights out of everything here, but it's going to be interesting. Especially that this whole thing's in a plastic chassis. And the batteries are still in it. Yay! Oh no, I did disconnect that. Okay. Wasn't complete and utterly moronic. Um, so far as I can tell, this chip is the one that holds the 16 tunes. As far as I can I could be wrong. Damn thing is stuck like nobody's business. No, nothing fancy going on there. Someone forgot to put the fume extractor on. Yeah, unless this chip actually doesn't do anything at all with the tunes. Well, I thought it did, I mean, since it's common in most doorbells. That's the thing, it's more the commonality as opposed to explicitly knowing. Ah, yeah, that hurt. Oh, this way you should have been here earlier. I'll let someone else in the channel describe what the problem is. No, what are they? We don't want the siren for the passive infrared detection. We just want the doorbell tune. We just want it to go ding dong when someone comes into the driveway, not. <laughs> So we're trying to find out how it differentiates or how it drives differently to give the doorbell versus the siren. Now I know it's differentiating by the different ID that comes out on the data line here. So this data line here, when it goes to this chip, it will then compare to whatever has been flashed into here for the bound devices that it's on or has. And if it detects a doorbell type one, which probably has one or two bits set a certain way, or a bit pattern set a certain way, compared to the PIR units. So like maybe it's got a 10 bit signature, first two bits indicate the type of device, that sort of thing. And then it will then tell this to pick either the siren or the doorbell. But that's the trick. We're trying to work out why, how can this tell the difference between it meant to be doing siren or doorbell? And as you say, yeah, maybe there's a, I don't know, there doesn't seem to be an I2C line into it. And this is why I was complaining that a data sheet would be awfully helpful right now. Hey, James E. Wing. Jonathan, Rage of the Board may be repurposing some sort of hard coded error output that bypasses the tunes and creates it. That is possible. That is possible. That certainly does happen. Yeah, authentic alarm sound. Yeah. Ha! <laughs> yeah. I wonder what an inauthentic alarm sound sounds like. So yeah, if I could do anything I wanted, all I would really need to do is change 
the coding coming out of here or the detection of those uh, which bits in here and make everything be treated as a doorbell but I suspect this NT620M2042 whatever chip I strongly suspect that that's a flash once type controller other doorbells seem to have like an NT200 and whatever Is there a drop down is there a drop down cap on the line? Um which line? Sorry, I don't mean to be difficult, I'm just sort of yeah. Kinda curious about all this up here. This here is a little more sophisticated. Okay, the this here, these are the I2C lines. You can see you've got a 10k, 10k, there you pull ups, so that there. this here is the chime selector there's also time based sensitivity on this so if you hold something down for 10 seconds it's going to have a different functionality to just pressing it um, okay this is data input section so that's basically just filtering the data bringing it up level shifting yeah so that'll be data in unfortunately we can't do anything with that so selector, data in, I2C to the EEPROM, or flash rather. Not really sure what we're doing here. Let's see, 100k, 10k, 100k. I wonder if it's a multiplexed, uh, level based, um, let's see. One, two, three, four. No, no, they're all individual selectors. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a little bit maddening. It's probably going to be something very obvious at the end of it all, but for now it's a bit maddening. So yeah, this here is all just data section. This here is audio generation. This here is probably ID storing and probably... It's hard to say. It may be holding what tune to play or maybe there's enough RAM in this that it... or you know, flash storage, EEPROM storage in this that it um, holds its... Um, the tune ID. But then the question is how does it tell this one which ID to play? How does that... how do they even communicate? That's the other thing. Oh, that's right. I was wondering about this line here. Right. Okay. This line, I don't know where it goes. So, if we can find out where that goes, we might be onto something. I'll take the battery out and I'll just do a bit of brush continuity testing. Yeah, you got the same site that I did, DevPom. You got the same site I did. That one with the little green, yellow, orange, and red, and blue dots on the chip. Yeah. And we found it didn't quite equate to what we're detecting here. I suspect because this is a more complicated device. Continuity mode. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to find out which pin along here. Okay. So pin one does something. I suspect that's how it's talking to it. It'd be interesting. I wonder if that's a. Um, I wonder if it's a tri-state input. If it is, we may actually have found a way to do it. Maybe. So I'm going to see what voltage we're sitting on.
Okay, 4.14. Hmm. I might short it to ground with like a 100k resistor or something like that, and then... Well, it can't be tri-state if it's at 4 point whatever volts. If it was tri-state, even with the input impedance of the multimeter, it probably should drop a little bit. Uh, just trying to find my axial resistors, which I find something that's about 100k. I don't want to blow the output pin. Ah. Zero one and stuff. <laughs> yeah, all right, fair enough. Jim wins that one. I probably got 10k in here somewhere. I think. God damn it! Why are all my resistors like 2.2 ohms, one ohm, 1.5 ohms, 10k? Hallelujah! Oh, looks like I bought a thousand of them. Here goes explosions. It's probably not even going to contact properly because I've got junk on the end of my resistors legs. Another? Hmm. Alright. It could be a one way data line. So it could be being pulled up internally. and it just clocks out whatever it is that it's looking for but it still doesn't explain how the hell they get the siren out of this chip that's confusing as hell At least I'm 90% sure there's no siren on. So I'll go through them. Uh, John Stater, that's the um, problem, is that it seems to be coming from the same line. So we're trying to work out how it's making things different when it's alarm versus this. And unfortunately my scope skills suck, so I can't actually check all pins at once. Yeah, well, Ben, um, I mean, you're quite right, so that's why someone was, someone made a mention about it being an error output, so that's always possible. And also, maybe I'll just do a bit of quick Googling. Chinese doorbell chips.
maybe because they have a real good habit of copying each other, we can find something that has a pinout that matches. Okay, what Except these are 16, this is only a 14 pin one, yeah, it's only a damn it, it's only a 14. So we've got a 16 pin one and and yeah. What is this this NT? Oh, well, that is crazy. They've got ding dong module chips just in three pinners. That's crazy. It's crazy, you get better data sheets on Alibaba than you do on Google. But I mean, this here is, this chip talks through SPI. So I have a feeling if we probe this pin here, it probably has the um, data that like, picks which what. And I also noticed on here that they do mention like you have programmable section uh, where was it there was something else yeah there may be just a mode that's in a different section like it's not just doorbell tunes in this it could be other things and they're selecting that ah oh boy here we go ask the same questions again The transmitter can't pick the tune because the, um, the doorbell ones, it, all it sends is just an ID. They don't send anything like that. Because you can reflash the ID. And there's the, um, yeah, it's, it's happening internally. Just can't believe how impossibly hard it is to find any data on these things. Honestly, yeah. Okay, NT. I can't even find this NT six two zero M. I can find an NT two hundred. But so far as I can tell, the main purpose of this chip 
is to allow you to manage the devices that it recognizes and such because you can program up to 32 devices into this chip that it will identify and so this here is just the microcontroller that decides you know, what's going on but yeah clearly something in this chip has you, know, you can select what um, tune you want and I would say although it's not a doorbell tune it probably is in there as a selectable device now if I was really good which I'm not and maybe I'll have to spend some time tonight doing this I will be able to capture the signal being sent into this pin as in the data, the bitstream and I'm fairly certain that it will be different between when the PIR activates versus when the doorbell activates it will send through a different address or something to play which ultimately however brings us to the issue that if that is the case then we can't really do anything the only thing we can do is to say pick off the LED output or something like that and use that to drive the speaker with our own audio amplifier or you know drop in our own little modifier so what we can do is we can just simply like pick up this here um, the driving of the LED and we glue on our own little microcontroller board which then feeds into this amplifier and we just put whatever beat that we can generate what about detecting the signal input that triggers the microcontroller from the pair? The they all come from the same place. They all the signal comes from here. Okay, the data stream goes in. The data stream goes into um, what was it? What did we say? It comes into this second pin here, and that will be like sort of ten bit sequence or maybe thirty bit sequence from the doorbell or the PIR and a couple of those bits will be set according to what type of device they are. Certainly a bus pirate would be more useful than a DSO in this. It's certainly easier, you know, it's easier for me to plug a bus pirate into this, capture the data for five seconds or so and then analyze that after the fact. DSOs are useful, but this is definitely not where I would like to be using a DSO all the time. I would prefer to use a bus pirate. Anyway, so if we were to modify this, we would really have two choices. One is to just drop this entirely, get rid of this, and put an AVR or something like that on this pin and read what it's sending and then base as soon as we see some data from there we go okay and you know put whatever tune out we want it seems like an extremely complicated since when has modifying not been complicated <laughs> it's, modifying stuff is always over the top waste of time it's a case of more satisfying your insanity rather than trying to be economical If you could read the chip or if it's encrypted. I doubt this chip is encrypted. This chip here won't be encrypted. Almost any of these doorbell systems are not really encrypted. You can very easily just capture the 433 megahertz data on the open air and um, replay it if you want. There's, there's nothing really encrypted or secret about it. It's very easy to be able to capture and replay particularly in these sort of scenarios for garage alarms and things like that sometimes they have a rolling code system which makes it a little bit harder so you won't be able to just capture and replay because it will say okay you just sent me that code I'm not going to um, I'm not going to open up because you just replayed the same thing let's have a look at that Arnold Gene 22 and 23 is their own links. Um, yeah, Arnold G, we've been we've been looking at that one too. Yeah, this is yeah. So this is where 
that comes up. That's what we've all been looking at. Uh, these zero ohm links, that's just probably for ground plane because this is a single side board. So we're just simply connecting up the ground planes. Yeah, so I think at this point my options are probably the easiest option would be to take this chip off, get rid of it entirely, watch for this pin with an AVR. I'm going to use an AVR because I know AVR very well and I've got a ton of them. <laughs> um, watch for activity on this pin on AVR and then generate my own audio out of that. That's the simplest way I can do it. You could modify the PR to output a different code, yes. Um, yeah, you definitely could do that. You could take a doorbell unit um, for the ID. There's not much to the PIR units. I suspect, though, the problem is going to be that they have probably got the top the bits that make the idea of whether it's a doorbell or a PIR unit, I suspect they are probably actually fused. We'll have a look at the chip. Maybe it's got one or two lines that are actually set by resistors externally, and if that is the case, we might have a chance. Yeah, so we'll have a look at that and see if maybe we've got some external selectors. You can say AVR, you can't say Arduino without me kicking you in the backside. Uh, the Arduino hate is because I always felt Arduino was a bit of a needless comp uh, needless overlay on C. It just kind of, it was a whole new thing to learn when really you could have just learnt C in the first place and the specifics of the microcontroller, like what you know, the pins are and you'd be done. But instead they bring in this Arduino and it's like it's easier and it's it really actually wasn't. It was probably easier more for the fact that someone said it was easier as opposed to it actually being easier. I mean some things were perhaps a little less daunting like setting bits or unsetting bits or there are a lot of pre-baked solutions particularly for setting things like the PWMing modes. I can understand that was a little bit frustrating. I thought a bit ambiguous in the documentation or felt ambiguous when you read it the first time but other than that no I thought it was a bit of a waste of time have you tried SDM32? no I haven't no alright so this chip here will hold the code and that code will get replayed when you press uh, when it detects NT619B, yeah. It's actually quite a marvel. You've got to appreciate the impressive how they've done this so cheap. Like this here is all the PCB antenna. It's really quite good. I mean, all you've got is a, a saw oscillator there and um, yeah, a couple of transistors here used for amplifying the RF that's about it 3.3 uh, volt regulator and it will this chip here will probably probably go into the base of some transistor somewhere and modulate the RF output 
I'm not sure if this is just OOK output or um, done differently. It's probably, I think, ASK, I think. Yeah, NT619. Now, I, let's see. So it's I doubt there will be any selector in there, um, external pin selectors on this. So it'll be flashed with something. This here, this switch, this randomizes the code. So when you press that, the code gets shuffled to a new one. So let's have a look where that goes. So let's see, 100k goes into here. So probably when that gets triggered, it goes bzzz, comes up for new code, but those lower bits are probably fixed. Yeah, the STM32s are very big in the drone community. It was um, mostly because at the time, I think Atmel really dropped the ball on this, because at the time, people were just managing to make drones and make, um brushless controllers work with things like 80 mega 88s or 168s, even 32.8s, but it didn't really have the um, spare cycles um, on hand to make it easy. It was always a real struggle. And at the time, Atmel was just bringing out the X-Mega. And on in the initial announcement of the X-Mega, it looked like it was going to be a great chip you know, and solve a lot of our bottleneck and complication issues but in the end the X Mega was a in my opinion <laughs> not that it counts for much uh, in the end I felt the X Mega was a, a dud in the sense that a lot of things that were hoped for didn't end up happening and they changed the interface to program it in such a way that it sort of took away from what made the 8 bit uh, AT, yeah, mega up. Uh, the 8 bit AVRs so popular. Yeah, no more was it a case of simply programming or anything like that. It became a completely different platform and it didn't really deliver it and it was expensive. And at around that time, that's when things up like the ST um, 32s were coming out strong and they, yeah, they swept up the market. Poor little MSP 430s were still going, what about us? What about us? I mean, you know, the MSP 430, it's a really nice, very low power chip. But again, it, it did suffer the problem that it didn't have quite enough grunt. It sort of lost its audience a lot to the AVR8s. Even though it was substantially more efficient in many ways, it wasn't enough of a winning feature for most people to go for it rather than the AVRs. It's a shame, yeah, it was a very nice chip. Well, it is a very nice chip, the MSP430. But, yeah, it just didn't have the market share. And like I said, the ease of the AVR8 series just washed away everything else. And then, yeah, Atmel made their own fuck up as it were when they they really just it may be considered second syndrome uh, second system syndrome with the X Mega and then after that they lost that momentum so the market was gone went to the STM 32s and so I guess once they lost that momentum they were happy then to be bought out by microchip and that's pretty much the end of the story ah oh, batteries yeah I'm leaving them out for the moment for the moment I've got other things I've got to get done. It's four o'clock. I've got to get a machine built. I may as well do that while I'm sitting here and you can all just watch with great boredom. Uh, let's see. Final data sheet. Let's have a look at this one. Oh, this is with the encoder one, yeah. Let's 
switch one, two, three, four. Yeah, it'd be something like that, and like I said, I'm fairly sure they'll have certain bits pre-encoded in there, a bit of firmware they've probably got in there. Whoops, wrong. Maybe pull ground both input triggers and chimes at the same time, might save a new chime. Uh, KZ, that's because that was much earlier on in the stream, much earlier on. Uh, we're gonna get this um, machine and reassemble it. Oh dear God, no! What did you just do? <clears throat> okay, I'll get this reassembled. through yet and it's been here for a couple of years now it'll get replaced soon enough ah that's way too much pull no oh well apple standards Yeah, John, I'll try to do that. No promises, but I will try. Probably should have done this assembly before I even started with the doorbell madness. This is what I should have picked up after I finished with the multimeters, <laughs> not the doorbell. I'm keeping pressure on the board because what I've done is with that thermal paste and I've sort of squished it back and forth. Uh, so it's created a fairly minimal layer between the heatsink and the chips. And it should have, if it's been done properly, a slight sort of reluctance to let go because of, of exhumed all the air from it. But it's not going to be enough to fight against these initial springs as I pull them down. Okay, now it should be good. Now I can let go and it won't separate between the CPU and the heatsink. Because you want the layer to be as thin as possible. So that, because thermal transfer compound, sure it transfers heat, but it's still not as good as metal on metal. Assuming that the metal is perfectly flat, which of course doesn't happen in our real world. When you zoom into the metal, it looks more like a craggly ridge with very few contact points. And we use the thermal compound to fill up those gaps. But like I said, it's still not as efficient as metal and metal. Unless you're in space. If you're in space, then metal will tend to self-weld when you bring it together. Which is kind of handy, but also probably kind of not what they want in space. This machine came in yesterday and its problem was that it has, uh, or it did have, but not have any more. It did have, um, it would tend to intermittently 
die when it was idle. While you were running it, it was fine. But as soon as you started idling, it would drop out and die. So it turned out that there was corrosion all down the side here. And part of that was in fact the... Uh, there's a MOSFET that handles the power switching to the sleep sections. So it was nice to find that smoking gun. And then throughout the course of last night I backed it up time machine and washed it this morning and now time to put it back together, give it back to its owner. Return it back to the wild as it were. This is a 281 board, by the way, for anyone wondering. But they're all pretty similar in this series. City Collier, they don't use the silicon thermal pads because they have an even higher thermal resistance compared to the paste, properly applied, applied paste. So certainly the Thermal pads are very convenient because you can cut them, apply them very simply. Um, you can reuse them, well, you shouldn't, according to the manufacturers, because they want you to put a new pad down every time. But you can you know, reseal it back up every time for a few more shots with slightly degrading qualities each time. But yeah, the amount of the th uh, thermal resistance is higher with transfer pads. No, no, it wasn't the sleep sensor. I mean, the sleep sensor had issues. No, it wasn't actually a sleep sensor. There was a temperature sensor that got corroded as well. But this ended up being the MOSFET, or at least certainly the gate drive for the MOSFET was problematic. It wasn't what I was expecting, to be honest. I, when I first got the job request on this, I was like, I don't know if I want to do with anything with this one because it kind of sounds like one of those I'm never going to be able to solve it. I can't find the fault type boards. But I was lucky. When I opened it up, it uh, had corrosion in the right spots. Interestingly, there was about three or four different faults that were about to start happening on a more regular basis all along down that side or this side wherever it was but it was the sleep one that decided to wake up first this Intel started sending down the dyes in the 10th generation as well so silicon pads probably run the risk of uneven pressure oh great Yay. I have had to use silicon pads in some of the newer machines where they use that um, crumbly not crumbly but the paste is not paste it's more of a combination of paste and little glass spheres or something like under things like the 1534 CPU and stuff like that. Damn it, Paul, you got to stop sliding that screwdriver down that slot. Oh good, Fluff, what was the prognosis for the situation with Fluff?
I'm thankful at least this is not an A20 O1700. I think the A20 O1700 is becoming one of the most disliked boards out there. So people see it and go, no, nope, dead, not touching it, goodbye. <laughs> Osteoarthritis and infection, but good kidney and liver function. Well, that's always good, especially with cats. Kidney, kidneys especially, they're so quick to give up on their kidneys. I think what doesn't help is that the number of items that we have in our houses can that can cause severe damage to feline kidneys is a little bit scary. We don't even realise it. Like a lot of people will have lilies around the house, as in true lilies, as opposed to just the water pond things. And if the cat gets lily pollen, if they ingest that, then uh, that's actually very deadly for their kidneys. And of course, cats are naturally inquisitive creatures. They'll go up and they'll sniff the flowers. And that's how it happens. Um, well, I don't know. I kind of take the trash book in one way because now at least the trash book is universally accepted as a trash book. And you can deal with it. But um, the O1700 is still a case of, but it's a good machine and I need it fixed. And you're like, I really don't want to touch this thing. Getting there, getting there. I'm actually feeling a little bit impatient probably because I've been sitting in this chair a bit too long thanks to that doorbell. Didn't really ring my bell for me. I, I think I'm going to chase the AVR solution for the doorbell. I think it'll be something entertaining. Probably just a Oh, uh, trying to think now. AT thirteen might even be okay, or maybe an AT twenty five. Since I've got a few spares of those, well, I've got a heap of forty fives, but I don't want to waste them. If I was a mad genius, I would do it with an AT tiny ten. Oh, thank you, Hugo. Oh, just yeah, very much. I do need the coffee after this, so yeah, much appreciated. Into the other. Uh, no, Pedro, I'm actually going to. I oh, will need one going off from the LED, but yeah, I'm going to try um, decode the data coming in from that controller chip. I'm not going to be trying smart about it. I'm just going to say, okay, we've had a 10-bit sequence here, so I'm going to assume that it wants me to ring the doorbell. So I'm going to do that. If I was doing it with an AT Tiny 10, that would be even more interesting. It's a fun chip, the 10, because it's usually you have to program it in assembly. So it's nice to get back to assembly, uh, particularly on a small chip like that. But, you know, you're not going to end up writing some humongous chunk of code. It can't be any more than 1K in size overall. Definitely one of those, let's do it for fun sort of things. Come on. 
What have I got left? The bits that are removed and the battery stuff. Where's the bottom case for this? Ah, <clears throat> oh, yeah. It's a little bit dusty. Just wash it down. If someone could tell me where my paper towels are, there they are. In that box I took to Townsville yesterday. Hey, Firkin. Okay. Ah, junk all over my pants. Yuck. Yes, complain to the universe, the universe will provide. I have generally found that to be surprisingly true. <laughs> surprisingly true. I suppose I should check that at Boots. something twenty volts, one here. Oh yeah, okay, I've got Apple logo. Just took a little while. <laughs> Alright, that's booted and fine. I hope. <laughs> I'm not obviously not showing you anything. Miles, I think the reason why they probably try to avoid the matte black or matte colours is they tend to the blemishes tend to be a little bit painful to. Uh, I guess it's a matter of perspective. Some people say uh, gloss is painful to look at, and thankfully this thing has booted right back up to where I left it before I shut it down. Whereas before, what would happen is it would come up straight away and say there was a problem in the previous machine. Okay, I'm just making sure it runs off the... Yep. So, this is all good. The person's going to be happy. Certainly I'm going to be happy because it means I'm going to get paid. I'm going to get some Muller. Yeah. I only need about 10,000 in a month. I've got a new project that I need to get done. And <laughs> somehow Mr. Daniels has to come up with $10,000 in a month. I'll probably be able to do it if I put my mind to it. I find if I if I can get Flexboard View on a stable release and then I can con important people like Lewis Rossman to make an announcement and actually you know, show it being used properly. Mind you, the hard thing with Lewis is getting him to use the latest version. I hate doing that. Do that. Yeah, fortunately I didn't scratch that. There's an old scratch there, but it's not mine. Um, yeah, and if I can get enough, even if I get like a hundred sales, that'd be great. 
or even 50. 50 sales will be all I need to do. And yeah, I think with the proper promotion, I can get that. So time to up the price. No, I think at this point, although you're right, yeah, pushing up the price is always handy. I think at this point, 179 US, we've sort of gotten up to where I think the market is happy with it. I've yeah, so I don't think I have any compelling reason to push it up any higher. It's uh, I've got to get the open board data stuff all sorted out. Need some more data there. What I am happy about is that we now have modern MacBook board views again. So like for the M1 series, and I've um, thanks to some people I don't know if they want to be named, but I've got yeah more iPhone boards that I'm working on. So. Yeah, the tools function it's me remaining relevant that's what I mean so Lewis seems to be outsourcing repairs to Anel and Paul S well that's because he's smart yeah PLD merch merch is good for um, some things but in terms of making profit it's generally not now it's more a case of I need to just you know generate more sales not too much sales from people who are trying to open PLD oh geez yeah People trying to open or oh, PDFs, open up PDF. Yeah. I do need to create some videos for Flexbird View. I mean, how many years I've been selling it now? Three, four years. It's about time I made a video on how to use it, as opposed to just hoping that people will work out how to use it. However, that said, I think it's nice if you can open up a piece of software, have no documentation, and find your way around it in fairly quick sequence and really other than maybe quirky button selections there's not that much in flexboard view that is specifically difficult to find out so anyway i am out of here i've got to go take this to the person who's waiting for it and i appreciate it that you're all here and put up with me going all ding dong and i'll see if i can catch up with you maybe later tonight maybe we can have a bit of a running stream with the atmel modification of that doorbell so all anyway, right i'm out of here you'll take care i'll see you next time